Have you ever wondered how the images of astronomical objects are made? I mean, apart from the fact that a camera has been attached to a telescope and pointed at the stars, how do astrophotographers and astronomers take the information that's been captured with those cameras and turn it into beautiful, full-color images of the objects in the night sky? To understand the process, we should begin at the beginning. And this is what the beginning looks like. What you're seeing here is an image of the Pac-Man Nebula as it appeared to the camera after being shot through a powerful telescope. That's a telescope with a lot of magnification and light collection ability. Now, if you're a rational, insane person, you're probably thinking there's nothing there but a black field and some white dots that are probably stars. But you'd only be partially correct. This is what images of astronomical objects look like when they're first shot. Most of the objects, such as the nebulae and galaxies, that are of interest to astrophotographers and astronomers are very, very dim. Much too dim for the human eye to perceive. And at the moment, the camera's perspective is pretty similar to the human eye's perspective. It would seem that the Pac-Man nebula is too dim even for the camera to perceive. But when the human eye looks at something, the photons enter our awareness and then they're gone. However, when cameras look at something, photons are captured by pixels, which are like little buckets for light. Every time a photon lands in one of those pixel buckets, another photon is captured, and every photon is saved as a small electrical charge. Cameras used for astrophotography have exposure times, just like regular cameras, though the exposure times for astro cameras are much longer than those used for earthbound cameras. Typical exposure times for astro cameras are anywhere from a few seconds to many minutes. This is important because, as you can see, objects in space are very dim, so those light buckets called pixels need additional time to collect photons. And as any given pixel collects photons, it builds up a greater electrical charge. Now a camera sensor is essentially a plate that holds many millions of these pixels, each with its own charge depending on how many photons the pixel has managed to capture. The camera sensor used to capture the image that you are currently seeing, in fact, held over 9 million pixels, which equates to over 9 million of those little light buckets. And this one image that you're looking at represents a full 60 seconds of exposure. At the end of an exposure, the information contained in each pixel within the sensor will be dumped into a computer for processing. This information can be viewed in a graph called a histogram. Presently, the histogram of this image looks like this. The histogram is a two-dimensional field that shows the value of the electrical charges within each pixel in the entire field of the sensor. The horizontal dimension of the histogram shows from left to right the dark, medium, and bright regions of an image and the vertical field relates the brightness of the pixels in that area. The brightness is determined by the electrical charge of the pixels, which itself was determined by the number of photons that were captured by the pixels in that region of the sensor. Now, it probably looks to you like there's no graph there, ergo there is no information there. But the eye can be deceiving. There is information off to the left. It's all compressed over on the left side of the histogram because the object we're imaging is very dim but we can zoom in on it to take a better look at the information that was captured. I'll do so now. Scrolling up the digits in the left number box tells the histogram tool to zoom in on the information. And because the tool expects the information we're looking for to be very dim, it defaults to zooming in on the left as we scroll in. You now see a curve that begins on the left and goes rapidly up and then tapers down to the right. This is called a light curve, and it portrays the visual information that was captured. It indicates brightness rises very quickly in the dark regions of the image and then tapers off slowly as we go to the brighter regions of the image. I can then tell the histogram tool to accept this stretched out light curve as the actual light curve for the image. Doing so brightens the image, transforming it from this into this. By stretching out the light curve, the deep sky object that was hidden in darkness is pulled into the light. However, I'm sure you will immediately notice a couple things. One is that more stars seem to be present in the image. This is because stretching the light curve also brought up the brightness of dimmer stars which were themselves hidden in darkness. The sky is filled with stars the human eye simply cannot see because our eyes have evolved for the light conditions of Earth primarily during daylight. We humans are diurnal or daylight-oriented animals. I'm sure you also have noticed that there is a haze throughout the center of the image. That haze is, in fact, the Pac-Man Nebula, though it's very poorly defined right now because, as noted earlier, this image represents only 60 seconds of light collection. Light is information. And given that it takes many hours to collect enough light to create an image of an astronomical object, 60 seconds is just enough to give us a haze. 
To get more information, we must spend more time imaging the target. We'll come back to that shortly. You will also undoubtedly notice that this picture is in black and white. It's not that the images that are in space are not in color, but rather that using black and white, or more accurately, monochrome cameras, will capture light more efficiently and effectively. So many astrophotographers prefer to use monochrome cameras to capture their images. But you're probably also aware that many images of space objects are in color, and we can, in fact, generate a color image from a black and white image. In fact, every camera sensor in the world captures images in black and white. The magic of color is brought to images through the use of clever filtering. We'll take a look at how that's done shortly, but before we do, we need to consider a few other things. I mentioned a few minutes ago that this picture is the result of just one 60-second exposure. This means the camera sensor was exposed to the sky for 60 seconds, and in the time captured as much light, or photons, as it could. Now, in the world of astrophotography and astronomy, light is information. But the objects that we capture are anywhere from hundreds to millions of light years away. They are so far away that even galaxies, which are made of hundreds of millions or even hundreds of billions of stars, every star being an individual sun, can only get a little light to us. To get a lot of light, or information, from an object in space, enough to be able to produce a really good image, we need a lot of exposure. Now it is possible to just expose a camera at the sky continuously and take one very long exposure. But that's likely to fail over and over again, for various reasons. Aircraft and satellites will undoubtedly trace across the frame, ruining the picture. Heat lightning may flash. There could be wind which causes the telescope to wobble. And many, many other things could go wrong in the making of a long exposure. So the best way to create an image of an object in space, an object that is very dim and requires a lot of time, often many, many hours of exposure, is to create a lot of short exposures and then add up all the information together from those short exposures in a process called stacking. Different astrophotographers use different exposures and stacking techniques that may vary depending on where they are in the local shooting conditions and the equipment they are using, as well as their preferences for developing techniques. For myself, when I shoot images of deep sky objects, which are objects outside our solar system, I typically shoot 60 second exposures. At the end of a long winter's nights of imaging, I can end up with as much as 900 exposures. And if they're all added together to determine the total amount of shooting time they represent, that time is called the integration time. To make a complete image of the Pac-Man Nebula, which we'll see shortly, over 800 minutes of integration time were required. Now for a monochrome camera to make a color image, we have to shoot the object through color filters. And when astrophotographers are attempting to image objects in a way that conveys their true color, they typically use red, green, and blue filters. Each filter captures the frequencies of light specific to that color. The red filter, for example, captures all the frequencies of light that fall within the red range. Astrophotographers may also use a fourth filter called a luminance filter. The luminance filter captures all the red, green, and blue light together. And it is used because it is very efficient. The color part of an image can be created with relatively little data. So by combining the information from the red, green, and blue filters with that luminance filter, sufficient light information to make a complete image can be gathered more quickly. There's also other ways to capture color images, such as the narrowband technique, but we'll keep it simple in this video and stick with this. Now this isn't much different from how color cameras work because the fact is, all camera sensors are monochrome. They only see the world in black and white, even the camera, for example, in your cell phone with which you use to take brilliantly colored pictures. A color camera is able to generate color because it has built-in red, green, and blue filters called a bare matrix. And software within the camera combines the red, green, and blue information to make a color image. In fact, this is pretty much how our eyes see colors too. Our eyes have color receptors that you might liken to the red, green, and blue filters of a monochrome camera. And our brain provides the software and hardware that mixes the information together so that our minds can perceive a color image. Some astrophotographers shoot with color cameras because it's a bit easier than messing with the information from luminance red, green, and blue filters. Sometimes I do that myself, especially when working with smaller telescopes. But when I'm shooting really dim objects with a very powerful telescope, I will use a monochrome camera because it is more efficient. And understanding that creating a color image requires shooting an object through color filters, and that it's helpful to use a luminance filter which makes the whole process go faster, I'll tell you that the image that you're looking at now was derived from the luminance filter, and over 400 images just like this were shot through the luminance filter. 
Those individual exposures, whether done on the luminance filter or any other filter, are called subs, or more accurately, subframes. And this is what all those subframes look like when stacked together. The increase in integration time may make the image a little brighter, but most importantly, all the detail now stands up more crisply. This image, which has all the combined information from the 400 luminance subs, is known as a master. In particular, this is the luminance master. Now let's take a look at the red, green, and blue masters, each of which contains about 133 minutes of information from the red, green, and blue filters. Were you expecting to see the red, green, and blue masters portrayed in the colors red, green, and blue? There will not be because these images were recorded on a monochrome camera. But the red image was shot through the red filter, the green image through the green filter, and the blue image through the blue filter. And if you look closely, you'll see that each image looks just a little different from the other. This is because each filter lets the frequencies of light associated with its color pass through more easily. And the final color will be created by the differences in the strength of the light and shadow information when the red, green, and blue information is combined together. Let's go ahead and do that now, and you'll see the red, green, and blue information put together and transformed into a full color image. Computer software assigns the values red, green, and blue, which are primary colors, to each image according to the filter that was used. And when blended together, the very slight differences in shading between the images creates this RGB or red, green, and blue composite image. But it's still somewhat dim, and that's because the luminance information has not been added to the picture yet. Recall that the luminance master was made with a filter that allowed the red, green, and blue frequencies through it, which is to say luminance captures all the visible light. And this is combined into a white light. It adds brightness, substance, and structure to the total image. Let's add it now. There, that's a little better. This gives us a finished image known as an LRGB image, or a luminance plus red, green, and blue image. Now this image still needs development to enhance the brightness of the nebula and sharpen up and refine the details. But if we try to do that with the stars in the image, starlight would be so bright it would overwhelm the image. So the stars are extracted with a computer application. With the stars extracted, see how much more detail you can see of the underlying nebula? Now we're going to enhance the brightness and sharpness of that information through a process of digital development. When the development is mostly done, we'll add the stars back into the image. And the brightness of the stars will be reduced so that they do not overwhelm the image. And lastly, because this image was filmed during nights of a full moon, the effects of the moonlight refracting through the atmosphere will be removed so that the coloration of the space will show up properly. The developing process presents us with a final red, green, and blue version of the astronomical object. And red, green, and blue is a good approximation of what the human eye would see. The color has been exaggerated somewhat through a process called saturation enhancement. This is to make the color stand out and pop a bit more to the human eye, which helps us to perceive the differences in details within an image. And it's very similar to how modern cameras add saturation to images by default. Human perception is generally inclined to snapping, popping color. Astrophotographers and astronomers also improve the detail visible within an image through a process of sharpening that helps things stand out more. This is necessary because the atmosphere knocks light around. Have you ever seen the lights at the bottom of a clear pool? The way it wavers and seems to swim and shimmer around the bottom? The atmosphere does that to any light coming to us from space. And sharpening software is used to counteract those effects, allowing us to derive a great deal of detail from those astronomical objects despite the atmosphere. And now you know how astrophotographers and astronomers create those marvelous images of the night sky. It may seem peculiar that these color images are all derived from camera sensors that can only pick up black and white detail. But the truth is, every camera sensor, even the one in your cell phone, or your DSLR, or your mirrorless camera, they all have monochrome sensors. Which is to say, they can only see in black and white. But those color cameras have red, green, and blue filters, and they combine the information they capture within the camera to produce beautiful color images. Astrophotographers and astronomers do the very same thing with the images they shoot in space, but because those images are so dark, and there are so many technical challenges in shooting them, such as working through noise, and the many, many hours that it takes to capture enough light energy from those objects to produce a good image, their process of development is more time-consuming and meticulous. But the images that result are beautiful, real, reflective of what's actually out in space, and worth all the effort for how they deepen our appreciation of the beauty and our understanding of the universe around us. Thank you for watching. If you have any thoughts or observations, please leave them in the comments section below. And 
If you yourself happen to be an astronomer or an astrophotographer, never forget, whenever it's clear overhead, get out there and shoot the sky.